Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar. My name is Olesa Chromychuk and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Um, we are a center for Ukraine-related educational and cultural activities. Uh, we are a registered charity and we work to broaden knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond by offering discussions and various projects that explore Ukrainian history, culture and current affairs. Now, I'm really glad that we were able to organize this um, webinar um, on um, the life and work of uh, Andrei Shuptitsky. Metropolitan Andrei Shuptitsky truly is an extraordinary figure. He was a count who um, came from a very wealthy family, but who chose to become a Ukrainian Catholic priest. Now, he chose to become Ukrainian when that choice did not promise any privilege. Um, he left an enormous legacy, and not only for the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, but also for the arts, education, and even business. Um, and yet his legacy is still not that very well known in Ukraine and beyond. So last uh, autumn, Ukrainian Institute London um, created a series of short documentary films, which we call 10 Things Everyone Should Know About Ukraine. And one of those films is about Andrei Shaptitsky, and it features um, Bishop Boris Gudziak. Um, please do take a look at it. It's, um, it's, it's a nice brief overview of the achievements um, of Andrei Shaptitsky. I uh, would also like to invite you to visit a virtual exhibition at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv uh, that you can view online about um, the life and work of Andrei Shaptitsky. But still, the legacy, the life, the work of Andrei Shaptitsky requires further exploration. And today we have an opportunity to discuss Andrei Shaptitsky in more depth with a really great panel of speakers. Now, each of them stress that they are not scholars of Andrei Shaptitsky, and yet they encountered uh, the man and his work in their uh, lives and in their work, which I think is very telling because they come from different walks of life. Um, and it's telling that each one of them was able to find something of interest and of use in um, the legacy that Andrei Shaptitsky left. So, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of tonight's webinar, Oksana Lemishka. She's a sociologist who is passionate about translating research into cultural products and strategies. She's an associate um, at the Center for Sustainable Peace and Democratic Development and a freelance researcher. And she has been consulting a variety of organizations, including UN agencies, the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine and the Ministry of Temp temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine on issues of social cohesion, culture, and peace building. Oksana, welcome. Thank you very much, Alexa, for the introduction and for, for the words about Andrei Shaptitsky. I'm absolutely honored to join the discussion today. I will stress it one more. This is an unusual panel where we're discussing something and we're none of us are experts in, in the topic. Uh, thus, we believe that exactly this format will allow us to to showcase a little bit how already many of Ukrainian great speakers and leaders in their fields are, are inspired by Andrei Shaptitsky. Um, my personal story with Andrei Shaptitsky dates back to where I was super little. I was born in Yavoriv Lviv region, where the small place uh, near which um, Metropolitan Andrei was born as well. And as a child, I wondered uh, what was uh, this big monument in the city center. and. Uh, my, my grandparents told me that this is a monument uh, of a great a Ukrainian priest and a national hero. Um, this is how monuments work in modern society, so probably the communization is not such a bad idea after all, but this is in another discussion. And um, I remember back then I was stuck with this image of a priest and a national hero, and it was with me for so long till the moment I started learning with the help of Ukrainian Institute and the help of uh, Catholic University, by the way, about who Shaptitsky was. And as Alessa said, um, personally, I'm inspired about, in my sociological work, I'm inspired about translating knowledge into social action um, and transformation. And even the discussion about Andrei Shaptitsky is energy given, as I said in a small uh, inspirational video for the Ukrainian Institute. And we recently had with our panelists uh, a short sound check talk. And believe us or not, for one hour, we're just brainstorming the questions and the directions in which we can have this discussion. So 
my job today is probably not very easy, but I will try to frame our discussion today around what can Andrei Szeptycki give us today uh, in current challenges uh, of the world and how do we talk about him today uh, so people relate, listen and use his heritage. Um, that's why I would like uh, to first of all introduce uh, the, the whole panel and then to come up with a question which would be to, to share some of the personal stories of how have you met uh, Andrei Szeptycki in your work, in your life. And also I will ask our panelists to personally answer the question, why do you think he's worth discussing globally since we have today an international meeting? And I would like uh, to invite first to, to the floor Natalia Popovich, who is an entrepreneur, international communication expert, civic activist, the founder of Fun Philosophy Group, co-founder and board member of Ukraine Crisis Media Center. And since Natalia opens our discussion, I would also like Natalia, maybe you could also give us a, a few facts about life and work of Shabtitsky that you find the most uh, key to our discussion today. Um, absolutely, um, um, and thank you so much for, for the kind introduction. It's an honor to, to be here today and to have this joy of actually um, uh, discussing uh, Szeptycki's influence on, uh, on our lives uh, in 21st century. Um, I think I, I personally think of Andrei Szeptycki when I feel overwhelmed. Um, I think of uh, the, the time that he lived, of the challenges that he faced, and yet how much uh, he was able to accomplish uh, in his one, one life. And um, I'm, I think I'm most uh, fascinated by um, his ability to clearly see the future uh, from his time through this complete chaos of the events that marked um, uh, his life between 1865 and 1944 um, by the clash of um, Bolshevism and Nazism, you know, two major totalitarian ideologies and lived, uh, you know, living through these major wars, uh, world wars and, and uh, unrest and Polish-Ukrainian confrontation and so many events that were happening at the time. And that he was able to become, uh, to make this choice, as, as Alessa had mentioned in you, to uh, come from um, a, a completely privileged background, yet to choose to serve probably one of the most unprivileged nations um, and, and, and communities as part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Ukrainian and to his um, becoming um, the uh, Bishop of Stanislav Diocese um, when he was 34, um, one of the poorest um, um, regions, right, in, in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and dedicating his life uh, to be able to serve to it. I think he um, fascinates me as, as, as a person of these uh, paradoxes of uh, as a Brazilian monk who knew how to make money and how to teach Ukrainians to um, to become entrepreneurs and become self-sufficient, and um, a person with means, a person who probably in today's uh, qualification would be multimillionaire or maybe a billionaire, but who um, decided to spend uh, all of his inheritance into the uh, funding of um, so many of these great initiatives and uh, actually institutions that have able enabled Ukrainians to um, survive. Uh, through the hardships of the Soviet regime and the per persecutions and actually to lead to the uh, the renaissance uh, of Ukraine's independence uh, after the uh, collapse of the of the Soviet Union, um, he um, he was a man of uh, you know um, of very strong principles and and being a Ukrainian patriot, we know also that he went, went against the the wave when he contradicted the even the Ukrainian uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists uh, of the 30s um, as he felt that their infighting had been damaging this Ukrainian's pursuit for um, self determination. And uh, I would argue that, you know, every nation, I think, needs um, his, his or her, you know, its own Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King or, or someone um, to look up to. And, and he is known as Ethnarch, as an Ukrainian Moses. And um, I think um, as a person 
completely open to Eastern and Western tradition, he was truly a major societal architect and, and a major investor, I would say, and I would argue into the human capital of Ukrainians. Uh, my personal connection to Shabtitsky lies in the fact that my great, my great grandfather was a, a priest uh, among the thousands of, of priests of, uh, uh, that, that basically Shabtitsky mobilized to be his kind of agents of change and lead that societal transformation um, in, uh, um, in Ukraine of that time. And I think he's extremely relevant because he was building the kind of um, uh, stakeholder capitalism <clears throat> and, and a capitalism with a human uh, face. Um, basically that only now in the 21st century we come to as, as the necessity to take the planet forward. And um, I feel that this is something that he uh, was building through the Christian principles and of course uh, through his willingness to serve the, the most underprivileged at the time. And that's what makes me think that he's extremely fascinating figure. And I hope that we will uh, share with the audience the tools that, that uh, the, the tools that he um, created in, in order uh, for all of this to, to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Nisala, very much. Uh, that was a, that's a great rundown. Just to, to stress that every sentence, because I was trying also to make my introduction short, but every time you mention how great he was in every area, you understand that you can unpack each particular area and go deeper. So after each sentence, you have a, a direction to investigate. I would still uh, like you, Natalia, to think maybe later in your answers, have you personally used some of these examples in your work maybe, uh, how applicable they are. But now I'd like to open the floor and invite uh, Sofia Opatska to, to the discussion. She's the Vice uh, Rector for Academic Affairs at the Ukrainian Catholic University and Founding Dean and Chairman of the Supervisory Board of Lviv Business School at UKU and a member of Executive Board of Europe European Federation of Catholic Universities. So Sofia, what is your story about Szeptycki and uh, uh, why do you think he's, he's worth of such an international discussion as the one we are having today? Well, um, good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and um, to reflect a little bit. Um, uh, it's interesting because uh, well, we hear in our childhood quite a lot in our education about Sheptitsky, but I think for me, uh, first real opening of Sheptitsky um, was uh, actually not so long time ago, maybe, I don't know, maybe like 15 years ago when I read a book written by Kurt Levin, um, who was saved by Sheptitsky and by his um, brother Clementi. Uh, Kurt Levin was a Jewish child, and um, uh, he was indeed, uh, he was saved over, I think, two years um, uh, during World War II, and then uh, later uh, he became quite a um, uh, famous uh, businessman, consultant, uh, abroad in, in the United States, and um, um, he, he actually writes this whole story of uh, uh, how he was saved and um, um, of this huge um, sacrifice which uh, many people uh, made at that time to save him. And it was it was very big opening for me um, about our church. It was huge opening to me about uh, Sheptitsky family, not only about Andrei Sheptitsky, but, but also about his brother. Um, and uh, later on, of course, um, you pick small things being a part of Ukrainian Catholic University, which was actually uh, started uh, as theology academy again by Sheptitsky. So you learn piece by piece small stories about this uh, great man. Uh, but probably uh, more um, detailed um, interest uh, started uh, around three, four years ago when um, we spoke with a couple of uh, friends, colleagues, um, uh, with Jurko Filuk from, from Prelat, Ivan Hlibovitsky from Promova company, and uh, when we spoke with Miroslav Marinovich, that um, indeed there are a lot of great examples uh, how business operates uh, internationally, and there are a lot of great examples of how people made um, great success in business or in, uh, in changing economy abroad, but do we have great examples uh, of Ukrainians? And it's interesting because it turns out that we can learn from from person from church from priest and bishop 
uh, probably much more than we can learn due to our history from um, from um, how business was operating in, in Ukraine. Uh, so we started uh, such a group as Shabditsky Management and we started to uh, with different scholars to, uh, to learn about uh, various great examples which we can take from the beginning of the 20th century uh, to beginning of 21st century and still learn from them and uh, um, uh, still reflect a lot with business people. And also one more observation, um, I noticed, uh, you know, that part of Ukrainian Catholic University, there is a beautiful uh, modern building, Shabditsky Center. And a lot of people come to this building every year. Some, some people come as students uh, and uh, they stay for some time here. Some people just enter this building for a couple of hours. And of course, I think this building created some kind of vibe and some kind of, um, um, created also some kind of learning journey for many people to, to learn about Sheptetsky, because uh, many of them are not from Lviv, many of them are not from Galicia, from Western Ukraine, and probably they did not learn, know so much about Metropolitan Sheptetsky before. And even our students, they come for four years, for two years, sometimes we offer some elective courses, they write essays about Sheptetsky, uh, they reflect, and uh, some of them are um, on our website. Uh, but some people come uh, for modular programs, again, they are not from Western region, and we were looking for the way how can we bring Sheptetsky in more details, how we can share more information about him. So since last year, we started to teach a case about um, um, Ukrainian mortgage bank, land, land bank, which operated, uh, which was founded by Sheptitsky and um, uh, Greek Catholic Church and some uh, Ukrainians from diaspora already at that time and some Ukrainian organizations. And by uh, discussing this case in the classroom, um, I feel that we share much more knowledge about um, Andrei Sheptitsky than we could do without that. Because again, this is bringing something from um, practice of 20th century, but something so interesting and so valuable that we can still learn and use in our practice in 21st century. So this is my uh, short, long story, um, and I would, I would be glad to share some more thoughts. Thank you, Sophia, a lot. And I think you touched upon a very important and challenging issue, since you're right that Shaptitsky is mostly famous in Galicia, mostly with really little information. And um, one of the questions I would like us, uh, maybe with also our viewers today, to, to brainstorm is how to make, and if it's possible, and should we, uh, Sheptitsky, a part of national co code of all Ukraine, and I, I think that your example of business case is, is a great way to, to promote this figure um, and so to make it possible to learn from him, not only um, in your university, but I hope that this case will be widely accepted universally. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm very pleased to invite to, to the floor um, Pavlos Mitsnyuk, who is the director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and senior lecturer at the KU Philosophy and Theology faculty. And uh, you may think that he might be the, the closest to the expertise on Shaptitsky, but uh, he studied ethics and uh, he studied Indian um, issues in his works. But still, Pavlo, could you answer us the questions about have you met Shaptitsky and what is the personal story of encounter and why should he be discussed internationally in, in your field, for example? Yes, uh, thank you, Oksana. I must disappoint you as well. I'm not an expert on Szeptycki. Uh, I met Szeptycki as a child because my grandfather and my grand uncle, uh, they both studied uh, in Viva Theological Academy uh, in the 1930s uh, when Szeptycki was uh, a metropolitan in Viv. So. Uh, I was used to see little uh, black and white uh, photographs, pictures of Shubitsky. So uh, I got too used to him. Uh, he was, I think, perhaps the, the only one uh, 
who was almost a saint, a living saint. Huh? Like uh, we never had any other heroes huh? in, in the family as much as Shaplitsky. Then uh, when I grew up, there came a boring Shaplitsky. Everybody was talking about Shaplitsky. You would have an anniversaries of Shaplitsky, and you lose interest completely. Yeah, uh, you, 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 you want to keep distance. And I think I rediscovered Shaplitsky very late uh, in my life and very recently when uh, Miroslav Marinovich yes, published, uh, published a book a couple of years ago about Shaplitsky and Win Win. And I thought, well, uh, can we really go back to Shaplitsky and uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, get a new Shaplitsky out of him? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I started reading uh, his letters. I started reading pieces of his biography. My studies in nationalism uh, like gave me a, a different perspective while, uh, while, while reading him. Uh, and then my interest uh, in uh, uh, ecumenism, yes, in relations between uh, different churches, uh, uh, also suggested that Shaplitsky might be really a treasure. So I think that there are at least uh, at least uh, three features in Shaplitsky that speak to me eh? and I think inspire me uh, in this work of uh, dialogue and reconciliation between uh, churches. First, he was cosmopolitan. Eh? So uh, he spoke different languages. He belonged to different worlds. That's why he, uh, he could become a bridge between different cultures, between different traditions, between East and West, uh, between different nations. I think if you don't speak different languages, if you don't try to understand the other, you can't really uh, be a bridge. And uh, uh, I think this is probably what Ukrainian Institute in London is doing, uh, yes, trying to speak both languages and speak to both, yes, the British and the Ukrainians. Uh, and I think in those conversations, you can really understand better yourself and the other. The second point about Shiptitsky, uh, which I find exciting, that he was very creative. And creativity is, is, is actually much more uh, rare than we would like uh, to be. Uh, he was uh, yeah, a metropolitan of Lviv in the moment when Ukrainians didn't have uh, uh, their nation, he was archbishop, he could easily be a bishop, and he didn't want to be a bishop, he wanted to be a creative bishop, so he became, a, a, I don't know, a businessman, uh, he became a, a diplomat, he became a political leader in, in a sense, uh, he became an, uh, a specialist in art, so his solutions were always creative. Eh? He never wanted to be what he was meant to be. Eh? And this, is, this, this invites you to, to cross your borders, try yourself in other, uh, other domains of life. And, and I think uh, that that's a great lesson from Chuplitsky. And the last point about him, that he was sort of uh, uh, unstoppable. Eh? He... Uh, he would dialogue with everybody. He would, uh, the Poles uh, arrested him and still he would talk to the Polish government, uh, Polish politicians. Uh, the Russians arrested him and he would correspond with Russian uh, aristocrats, with Russian uh, bishops. Like there was no way to stop him talking to people he was interested in. He had his agenda in, in, and, and like no taboos there. And I think, uh, also, Ukraine today, which is wounded because of the conflict, uh, we can learn from him uh, uh, about this. We can learn trying to talk to people, uh, never to surrender and to continue dialogue, even if, if, uh, uh, if people think that we shouldn't talk to, to the others. So that's why I find him uh, as, a, as a really a moment of inspiration in, in my life and, and work. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlo. And it uh, brings me to, to wonder if church is helping or not uh, Shabtitsky to become popular these days. I hope you can also touch upon this issue. 
as well because you were discussing some of his non uh non-church characteristics uh We'll go to, I have so many questions, I feel stressed that we have a little time, but I will try to pack it somehow, please don't feel pressure to answer to all of them, but some of your answers inspired me, and uh, for example, uh, Natalia is a sociologist, uh, we recently finished this uh, um, study of Ukrainians, uh, asking them about uh, proudness of being Ukrainian, etc., and very often they they name a part of being proud uh, to be Ukrainian is this international recognition, is this connection to, to the world. Everybody wants to feel part of the world and have this recognition internationally. And your lecture was one of the first lectures I watched on, um, so I'm a true Ukrainian. Uh, I watched on Biennale because you called it in a fancy way, Scandinavian part of Shevtetsky. So maybe, Together with the question I asked earlier of have you personally resorted to Shiptitsky in difficult moments, you can tell in a few words about what is so Scandinavian about Shiptitsky. Um, well, um, here kind of I, I speak a little bit, you know, from, from just the experience of um, uh, living in, in, in Denmark for the last uh, couple of years. And uh, I say that I see uh, Denmark as a country where um, if, if everything that Chupitsky tried to do in Galicia in the beginning of the 20th century uh, was able to flourish, if, if it was not interrupted by the Soviet regime, uh, this is how I think Ukraine would have looked like. Um, it would be a very um, human, uh, high trust society uh, with people who are able to collaborate um, uh, and people who uh, are able to innovate uh, if they were to take on and continue um, these you know institutional changes that uh, Shaptisky was, 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 was trying to, to make and that's something that I find so uh, inspiring because there are so many countries now that look up to this Nordic secret to this Nordic uh, uh, how do how do Scandinavian countries uh, are able to have this uh, GDP per capita and uh, and at the same time um, to be to, to, to have such such high level of sort of human centered uh, you know economies in in them um, I think um, there are some common commonalities actually of what was happening here uh, in the 19th century and what uh, Shaptitsky was uh, doing in, in Galicia in uh, in Halicina in um, in the beginning of uh, of uh, the 20th century um, in Scandinavia um, um, I think the secret of, of this achievement that there is today is, is rooted in the uh, professional and, and uh, folklore and um, kind of national education that they started um, uh, in uh, mid um, 19th century. Uh, for, for Denmark, it was 1964, these, these professional folk schools uh, who um, I think were preparing these uh, nations um, and people to get a little bit more complicated as the world was getting more complicated and more industrialized, um, more more different dimensions of realities of relationships between uh, you know the capitalists and the, and the workers and and uh, the industry changing uh, lives uh, as technology is changing our lives right now so there was this vision that you have to invest into people to make them be able to uh, fulfill themselves in these new realities it did work out here because in Scandinavia there was, you know, continuous peace almost. Um, in in Ukrainian circumstances, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, he was able to foresee that, and I think um, uh, the welfare economy that we have that the, the, the exists here in Scandinavian countries, he was trying to cover it as a as a personal investor because the number of orphanages that he opened, the number of counseling uh, schools for mothers that he opened, um, the number of um, youth organizations that he created, the number of schools that he created, and the number of reading houses at the time that he created. He was saying that every village has to have a reading house or a book house, uh, that all you need is a, is a kind heart and a book, and, and you can start it. And uh, the priest had to do to, to kind of lead this, this, this process. Uh, so he, I think, very much understood that you have to lift people up from this survival mode and take them into uh, the mode of fulfillment and creativity, and that can only be covered when welfare basic needs are taken care of. And I think, again, his relevance to me is with the pandemic, so many countries are coming to the realization how important it is to have uh, for all of the people a good access to high quality education and high quality healthcare, how essential it is. That's something that I think he clearly understood, you know, years and years ago. And then the second moment, I think that that is really um, innovative about him, as, as Paolo had mentioned, he, he was innovative, 
is creation of these institutional tools, basically, because if we talk about the economy, uh, in Scandinavia is huge on uh, collaborative spirit and communal spirit and ability to collaborate to, to decide on, on, on biggest challenges. And that's what he was able to uh, pursue through creation of uh, the first Ukrainian day reunion, the first, you know, these banks, these, these, these uh, communities of cooperatives that actually were um, becoming uh, strong and were winning market share um, even against, uh, you know, more established Polish um, uh, unions. And uh, people were learning to uh, collaborate, to become self-sufficient and to, to become greater entrepreneurs but at the same time um, he was promoting things that seem to be innovative these days like fair play uh, fair process leadership that now is being taught in INSEAD um, uh, for owners and and, and boards um, he was uh, considering it to be basic infrastructure for having a business so he was promoting uh, fair trade not to sell low quality goods and that applied to peasants not to cheat uh, fair pricing not to deceive others and that meant that if you are an owner of an enterprise you should not be lowering the price of something just because you pay your your um, employees less and fair pay not exploiting others you know these principles again if we think of now how how the the whole world is, is reimagining our future um, with the pandemics and and just prior to it how companies are beginning to rethink their responsibilities to all of the stakeholders um, all of the elements Elements of, of these systems, you know, were in play in his thinking when he was creating these um, these organizations. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think at the time he also established uh, some of the first, you know, and most important um, cultural institutions as well. That uh, at that time were also beginning to um, to to you know bear fruit. Uh, um, that now maybe we see in, in institutions like Ukrainian Cultural Fund or Ukrainian Innovation Fund. I think if he lived today, he probably would have contributed to that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, so much. You're right. You, this, this is my short story when I want to pitch a bit to others. It's like invested in Amsterdam restaurants, did gold digging, made business banks, and it works really well because, as I said earlier, sometimes we, we fall into this national hero priest and as Pavlo said, you try to keep away of those big national heroes, which anniversaries are celebrated so often. Um, when we had a call uh, to, to do the sound check, which ended uh, really uh, for so long, Sophia said something that really resonated with me. We all were discussing all these beautiful features of, of Shabditsky, who is creative, innovation, businessman, etc. And Sophia reminded all of us that spirituality came first in, 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 his, uh, in his activities. And uh, uh, I honestly, also in our research, we see that current world as we find it right now, lacks institutions or places or public spaces where values would be produced and discussed actively. And I think it's my personal opinion that we should stop making bridges between institutions that produce values and try to adopt some of the value system which are beneficial win-win situation as Pablo mentioned um, for, for everyone. And Sophia, maybe you could comment a little bit more in, in your case, the spirituality and business specifically, how does it, how does it work? Uh, and um, yes, how can we learn from Well, Shabbat? that's a tough question. <laughs> it, uh, you know, we have uh, from time to time with Natalia discussion that uh, it's very popular in our society to choose either or. So you can be either a spiritual person nice you know but all values but yeah. then you don't want to touch uh, business you don't want to have anything to do with business and this is something what you probably do not promote very much on the other hand you know if you're in the if you're in business um you do people don't imagine that you can have any spirituality because you're probably all about money competition uh, deadlines targets and, uh, and 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 where is spirituality there so i think shiptitsky in many ways shows us that th this is very much possible and uh, indeed he was a great example how it is possible um i think he he as a priest, he was looking for, spirit, for spiritual development in people, um, for their uh, dignity. And um, at the same time, 
probably he he was aware that um, or he he understood that it's not so easy to develop and talk about spirituality if people are very poor if they are illiterate if they um, have a problem there was a huge problem of alcoholism uh, in Galicia uh, uh, at that time uh, children were not going to school um, it was mostly agricultural uh, part of Austria-Hungary, but it was not really efficient. Uh, uh, the agriculture was not efficient at that time, comparing to, to what was happening in Europe uh, already. So I think his idea to invest resources and invest his time into economic and business um, parts uh, it was not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal was human dignity and spiritual um, uh, values of, of Ukrainians. Uh, but, but to get there, you also need some means and instruments. So he was using them really well. And Natalia very nicely uh, already described that um, very basic principles like fair price, fair wages, um, don't cheat, uh, develop yourself. Uh, become um, become an entrepreneur and 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 rely on yourself. There is actually a very nice um, um, part of the letter which uh, which is described in uh, Maroslav Marinovich book, uh, which was already mentioned by by, by Pavlo um, Andrei Sheptitsky and Win Win Principle. Um, so so there is a part of the letter which he writes. At, uh, to young people and how to educate young people. And he is saying that in this letter that young people should rely on themselves, on their initiative. And this is how we have to educate young people so that we have a future as a nation and probably as a country. And if I, you know, when I read those lines right now, I think nothing changed between the whole, in, in, in the whole century. Uh, it is still on the agenda for Ukraine. It is still on the agenda for young people in Ukraine uh, to take this initiative, to, to become independent, to take responsibility and uh, not to rely uh, on uh, and not to have paternalistic approaches in life. So um, I think he was very much, uh, uh, he was much more visionary than we can imagine him. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sophia. I, I truly hope that some of the cases that you mentioned and that we can come up with actually a Shetitsky International Workshop School for Business People. So we can also make business a place where values are exercised. And uh, I'm happy to know some of the companies that already are doing it internationally, but I think it's not, this is except, exactly the case where some of his works can be inspiring internationally. Uh, so. Um, I truly believe that we can make something great in future. I, I, um, think, there's a, I think there's a growing community of these um, kind of purpose and profit, you know, businesses in Ukraine. And I think uh, there is, a, there is a, of course, uh, even the alumni of Lviv, Lviv Business School, I think, are contributing to it. And I think it's great that, um, that the students there um, have a chance to um, to learn from Shatitsky's legacy as well, but I think now people are just coming to it more from the perspective of common sense, you know, and and, and capitalists for long have refused to recognize any sorts of responsibilities. Uh, in modern world, it's only what two two years ago where all of the largest companies have signed the letter recognizing that if they carry on in an irresponsible way as, as before, we simply won't have the planet very soon. So they came to it more from the perspective of necessity rather than from the perspective that he was coming from. And he was coming from the perspective that, you know, um, these people need to have dignity and, and the only way to uplift them is, is through um, uh, more of a educational, more, more of the education and more of the ability for them to become self-sufficient. Exactly. And it was that, that, this, these qualities are, are given with your life and you are not supposed to fight for that you get. And it's, it's, it's especially great to realize that such a person was part of the Ukrainian history and we are not borrowing in this case, but we are building upon and I think this is something we could carry on with. Um, uh, Pavlo, Mr. Pavlo, I have a very provocative question for you. You mentioned that you were studying also nationalism um, and we know that uh, Shaptitskin being a patriot was also not nationalist, was also a very international person. 
could you maybe comment a little bit on on his attitude towards nationalism, patriotism, and let's imagine the situation Shabtitsky is a leader in Ukraine uh, today. Would he choose church as his as his platform to to make changes, or would it be a different institution? Yes, sir. thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, it's a tough question. I think that we need to understand about Shiptitsky that uh, he was uh, born in uh, Austrian Empire, yeah, Austro-Hungarian Empire. He then happened to live in uh, like the Polish nation state when Ukraine wanted to become a nation state and didn't manage, and he died in the Soviet Union. Man. So he, he is a kind of an imperialist in a good sense of the world. Eh? And that he's like, uh, the easiness with which he speaks different language just uh, speaks to different contexts. I think it shows that for him, there is something that is more important than just national identity. Eh? But at the, at the same time, he adapts very quickly. Yeah, okay, we are not playing empires anymore. We are playing nation states. How in this context can I help my people, my parishioners, yes, to be better, eh? uh, to be better Christians, to be better citizens? So he tries to play this, this game of the nation state, but he doesn't become a nationalist. Yeah? And I think there is even, even a, a bit of competition between Sheptitsky and the church and the uh, Konovalets and uh, uh, other Ukrainian nationalists. So there is a competition, sort of a struggle for souls. Yeah? And when you see, when he's trying to, for example, organize all sorts of youth uh, congresses, uh, uh, huge, uh, probably like regional uh, meetings of young people, it's a competition with the nationalists. So he, he, he tries to show that there is a different way to be a Ukrainian, and it doesn't uh, entail being a nationalist, it doesn't, uh, entail hating the others. Now, regarding your question about the church as the, uh, uh, as the place, as the platform from which to do this, this, I don't know. I think that when Shepitsky uh, was the metropolitan in Lviv, Ukraine didn't have any political institution. So he sort of played the role that wasn't his own as a bishop. He played it because he probably felt that if he doesn't protect political interests of the Ukrainians, nobody will. If he doesn't, I don't know, open uh, an art uh, uh, art shop, a workshop, nobody will. If he doesn't help to uh, to uh, develop uh, cooperatives, nobody will. So he does things that probably today he wouldn't need to do because, uh, because there are all sorts of institutions that can do this. Uh, there was only church uh, in Shepitsky's times. Today we have our political institutions, cultural institutions, etc. However, uh, unsatisfied we can feel about that. But, but at the same time, I think that the church today can learn a lot from uh, Shepitsky. What, what uh, Sofia uh, said earlier that uh, often we think that to be spiritual means that you should keep away from business. Uh, uh, and then, yes, Natalia explained how exactly Shepitsky tried to be outside the church to help these people. I think that this curiosity, uh, this going out into the world is something that uh, our church should be doing, you know, if if the church is uh, is just uh, limited to the church building, it's completely useless. Uh, and the gospel is about the transformation of the world. Eh? It's not about providing uh, one hour entertainment on, on, on Sunday mornings. So 
I think that the church should try to get out to understand how the business work, how the political world works, why art is important. There is the world that we need to learn from. Huh? Okay, thank you, Pavlo. There is, uh, if I may, there is a great business approach to learn about hassle map of your clients, uh, to know about problems of your uh, people who come to your parish. Uh, that's the way to learn uh, about other parts uh, of, of society. <laughs> Yeah, I think now this all would all be very much connected to your kind of customer journey and and mapping uh, and understanding what are all of the kind of weak points and how do you address them. And we'd be surprised uh, how, again, the priests would be able to, again, be the schoolmasters and the providers of the stipends for the, you know, kids from the underprivileged families and uh, the founders of local banks and cooperatives and etc. It's, um, it's not that different, you know, I think overall, the beginning of the 21st century is not that different uh, from, from the beginning of the 20th century. If you think of how many people need to be reskilled uh, just due to the introduction of technologies and, and, and that's another huge reformation that has to take place and there is a, there is a place for church in it as well. Yes, uh, indeed. And uh, I remember some of the lessons I, I had at my studies abroad of how priests in some of the Catholic Church uh, were making sense of the events, current events happening in, in the world. And I think uh, this is also another platform that needs to be activated for, for discussions and to, to, take, to, to, to take the relief a little bit from the current tension. Natalia, may I ask you also to maybe comment on the nationalism issue? I remember during the test call, we had also a, a discussion with you uh, about Chuptitsky and he, him as an national hero or a patriot or well i think um if we perceive the word nationalist as as a patriot i think he was he was a patriot but i think he understood and maybe the difference the way i understand his differences was the own or the organization of ukrainian nationalists at the time um, were in the fact that he wanted the young people especially to make informed choices. So for example, when um, we know that there was this incident when Ivan Babi, the director of the Ukrainian school, was um, killed um, at the orders of OWN, um, because they would love would have loved for the for the graduates of, of or the 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 students of, of the school to join uh, the organization as soon as possible. Uh, Shpitsky was extremely critical, and not only cr critical of the fact that how is it possible that that members of the same community um, that that is facing such huge threats from both the Bolshevism and the Nazism and and, and fighting with Pol Pol Poles etc. Uh, how can they fight among themselves? Um, but also because I think he. Was was defending the point of view that kids should make uh, should grow and 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 make their own ways of how to best to defend you know this Ukraine's right to self determination, and um, and he was I think doing it in, in a wise way. At the same time, we need to understand that um, uh, ninety percent of of uh, all of the Ukrainian I don't want to say elites, but all of the prominent Ukrainians who later have become members of the OUN and who have been part of the Ukrainian insurgent movement and who have fought uh, Bolshevism and the, re the, the, the Soviet regime after the World War II, many of them, they were the alumni of uh, the institutions created by Sheptetsky because they were members of Ukraine's Kamolot Christovi and they were, uh, you know, members of PLAST and, and I mean, all of the, uh, all of these institutions created by him. But I think he was um, taking a more of a kind of a longer, um, longer term view on it. Uh, what also resonates with me in particular is, is kind of his principled um, uh, his principled attitude, um, you know, especially towards Bolsheviks, like he is, you know, he is quoted saying that we need to understand who our enemies are, basically, and that the only way for them to um, kind of repent is, is if there, there was a, this passage of like, if, if no one in the village is going to stand next to, to the traitor, if, if no one will, will shake their hand, if no one will, um, uh, will speak to them, then maybe, um, you know, they can become a, a member 
member of the community. And in that sense, I, I, sense, I think, again, there is, there is so much resonance more, I think, on the international scene right now, um, where we, we, you know, Russia had attacked Ukraine and there is international sanctions, you know, so I think Shaptisky would have been on the side of the sanctions because if, 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 um, uh, if there is a negative influence on the society, you have to defend it. And, and that's what he was doing in some of the instances um, during, during his time. And he was very, very vocal about it and very principled about it. Um, I think that edge of moral and, and um, good and evil, and now for, for a lot of people right now, are much more difficult to detect. Um, but he was very clear about it. Yes, and it is a very challenging thing to do when some of the things you, you claim, uh, he was always putting it into practice. He was never a man of the word, he was always a man of an action. Um, this is a challenging discussion to, to have and uh, this international and geopolitical situation that Ukraine is now facing. But you started touching upon already saying if he would be today, he would mm -hmm. support sanctions. Maybe we could open the floor to also Sofia and Pavlo and, and follow with this logic. If Shaptitsky would be today, which lessons can we draw for him, active lessons for, for the situation now in Ukraine? in current war with Russia and also internationally in, in relationship uh, with other countries? Um, well, I think he would have been doing what he did back then. I think uh, he understood that um, the only way that Ukrainian community can be sustainable, can be resilient, is if it has a strong moral character and if it's unified. Um, so I think his way of doing it was through the promotion of culture and promotion of arts and him investing so much into the very modern artists of the time, like Novakilsky and, 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 and others who were founders of different art schools and to working with architects who are a little bit ahead of their time and um, investing into this, um, you know, not just literacy, but also, you know, cultural programs. So I think he acted as current Ukrainian, Ukrainian cultural fund. So I think he would have definitely, um, he would definitely support many of these grassroots uh, cultural initiatives that help people to feel the connection with where they're come, where, where they're from and, and, and uh, build, um, you know, the genuine uh, love and willingness to have a dignified life where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at the same time, what he probably would do, I think even like on a cultural, on the diplomacy front, you know, he he did negotiate, I think um, with Hollywood, he wanted to make a movie um, uh, to um, uh, bring truth about Holodomor and and he he invested in ventures like, you know, um, photo studio in Chicago or, or um, obviously in, in different locations of uh, sort of these cultural things. I think he probably today would be kind of the person who would be opening Ukrainian embassies with like the Netflixes and Apples and uh, and uh, um, Amazons of, of the world and uh, uh, kind of going into these very innovative um, innovative alliances and I think that he would have treated the planet today as as a, as a, you know there are people who kind of are local but there are people who who treat the globe as a, as a um, um, he, I think he would be looking for a master plan for the planet, you know, and, and then thinking what is the role of Ukrainians in it, um, you know, so I think he would be looking always from this very, very global perspective. And I think that's that's an important lessons for, lesson for Ukrainians and for, for other nations as well, not just to look at our local issues, but to think how can we become not part of a problem, but part of a solution. And, and in that regard, I think his, his thinking is very, is very relevant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, Sophia, I would also like you to comment on this one, and, and I briefly just have to say, um, uh, as well, my sociological background speaks up to me, we were measuring if Ukrainians would support ties with Russia under current conditions, and we measured four types of ties, economic, political, uh, family, uh, was, and cultural. And when it comes to political ties, few Ukrainians would support political ties with Russia under current conditions. But we have numbers growing when we talk about uh, cultural cooperation, economic cooperation, and of course, family cooperation. So especially the more we move to the East, the more we see that people would be open to cooperate on this other than political levels. Um, what is your take on, on this in, in the frame that we are discussing right now when Natalia started? 
Well, well I think it's another, it's another dimension of a, either or, uh, which probably does not exist because you, it, it, there are some short-term decisions which need to be done and which have to be done on their principal level. And um, exactly what Natalia was mentioning, we can only imagine how Shaplitsky would behave in this situation, but, but uh, given the examples of his behavior um, at the time when he lived and when political turbulences were probably not, not less than right now, but even more, um, but, but there's also this long-term dimension. And I think we, sometimes we are focused too much in Ukraine on short-term and we are not combining that with the long-term. It, it, it is also regarding business plans and business thinking. Um, we look for very quick return on investment. We look for very quick uh, um, gains from, from decisions we make. Um, but um, I think Shiptitsky was um, uh, is very interesting for us also to learn how he was able to combine with some um, very clear long term strategies to support what he, what he was deciding short term because education art youth those are not things which will give you any benefits in the short term but when we look at at 30 years of Ukrainian independence, I think we have such political issues exactly because we were not, we were under investing into education, youth, art, and, and things which were influencing the minds of people. And I think we mostly have a problem exactly with minds of people, with their way of thinking and um, economy, po politics, this is all the consequence of that. So I would say that what we should definitely learn how to combine our short-term decisions and, and, um, and choices with some, some, some kind of long-term vision of what we would like to achieve in the longer run. And probably we should talk about reconciliation as well here, because at some point we will have to talk to people who are on East we will have to talk to people who are in Donetsk and Luhansk now. Um, there, sh there, will, there should be some way found for that. We don't know when will it happen, how it will happen, but, but probably we will have to get there because we are still on this one earth and, and, and somehow we have to, uh, to find some common ground for that. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sophia. Yes, you're absolutely right. I just want to, to, to make it clear that the question was asking not about cooperation with, with the east of Ukraine, but with, with people from Russia, with cultural and economic institutions. And I absolutely second that, that you should think broader, at least 100 years ahead, as Shaptitsky would say, so to have these long-term strategies, which we are currently lacking. And um, maybe, Pavlo, you could add also on this question. So initially, I, I wanted to add that Shabditsky would find friends abroad and that he would like counteract this like relativistic approach to, to the conflict uh, uh, in Ukraine. But I think now after Sophia has spoken that I should rather develop her ideas. And I think they are, uh, they really uh, are worth uh, stressing. First, uh, about this long term. Yeah, if you think uh, everything Shapitsky did got destroyed uh, perhaps during the last years of his life or shortly afterwards, everything, yes? The, the, the hospitals, the churches uh, were given to the Orthodox or nationalized. So in theory, you could have said everything he built kaput. Yeah? And still, now we see in the 1990s, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has returned, yes, has risen, uh, thousands of people uh, came back to, to the church. So you could say, but this is what Shepitsky did, and still, yeah, decades afterwards, you have the result. Now, he didn't invest enough in art 
and in business, because now aesthetically, yes, and business-wise, Ukraine would need a little bit more. But he probably invested a lot in the church, and we have churches full of people. Uh, this, I think, if we read what has happened in Ukraine uh, linked to the conflict uh, with Russia, I think that we got scared too much about this conflict. Uh, Szeptycki survived two wars, a revolution, uh, interwar period. Probably he, he somehow got adapted to everything that is happening. And I think we somehow got almost blocked by this conflict. We got somehow scared. Yes, it, 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 uh, it mm, deprived, uh, deprived us from air we are breathing. It, it, it made something very, very strange. I don't know how to verbalize this, but my feeling is of sort of consternation. So I think if, we, if you read Szeptyski's life and if you see the wars and revolutions he survived, you would be perhaps more relaxed. Yeah? The second uh, point that Sophia mentioned about dialogue. I think what is uh, particular with Szeptycki that he, uh, when he dealt, for example, when you see how he uh, dealt with, with, with the Jewish people. Yeah? So on, the, on, on one hand, he tried a little bit, uh, especially before the Second World War, he had this idea of converting uh, uh, the Jews to uh, Christianity. But during the war, he didn't look at them as the Jewish people. He looked at them as people. So they were to be, to be uh, in a way, uh, helped, saved, and no child that was educated then by, uh, by Ukrainian nuns or monks uh, uh, has been converted. So I think we need all try to see in, in our fellow Ukrainians who are living in, uh, in, uh, around our country and including in the East and in the occupied territories in Crimea, we need to look at the Russians also as people, as human beings with whom we need to see beyond ideology. Eh? If we don't do this, if we see only ideologies, we won't be able to, to advance. Eh? We, we will be blocked. Ideologies cannot talk, only people can talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the, the more you, you, you talk, the more questions I have in my mind, but you have to open up to, to the question and to the commentary session. But before I do this, I would like you to, like our panelists, to think of maybe one sentence for, for the ending of our meeting. Another problem that Ukrainians face today uh, after, after the recent research is that when we ask what Ukraine is, everybody fails to answer. And we asked East, West, Center, small villages, big towns. Uh, people fail to answer what Ukraine is. So maybe for, for the ending of our meeting after our Q&A session, you could think about this sentence. So if you, were, if you are inspired by Szeptycki, what would be the sentence that what Ukraine is, what we as Ukrainians should, should think and promote? Let's think it, uh, about it as a branding exercise for, for Ukraine. Um, and now I'm really happy to invite to, to the floor Rena Marchuk, um, who uh, will add a commentary about one more important side of Szeptycki activity, which is PLAST. Pani Rina, uh, please welcome. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry, I should just switch into English. I do apologize. Um, I was not meant to speak about uh, uh, we, um I'm sort of representing PLAST, which is a uh, the Ukrainian version of the scouting uh, organization, the global scouting organization, and, and PLAST was mentioned before. So I wanted to um, uh, mention our gratitude to uh, Andrei Szeptycki, who in the 20s had the vision about exactly what we were talking or parts of what we were talking about investing in youth and he uh, amongst many other things but one of the main thing which which i'm aware of um, is he donated um quite a nice piece of land in the carpathian mountains as a as a um, as a, uh, a center of campsite and uh, and uh, educational site for Plastone, the Ukrainian scouts. So I've 
we have a book on him published by by Plast, which I would want to show it quickly to you. Uh, unfortunately, I was not meant to speak, so I can't go much deeper into into his uh, into his investment into into this uh, organization. But he was also provide, and if that was not not as a Catholic or as a Ukrainian Catholic uh, 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 church person, but he was supporting uh, Orthodox youth from Walling to uh, join in, bought equipment, helped them with traveling. So he was, there was no distinction for him on religious, um, uh, uh, along uh, religious lines. Uh, one thing which um, was mentioned before, uh, the which, so that's my end of my statement. But but what uh, what I would like to ask the panelists, has anything shifted recently in the question of um, him being uh, uh, awarded the status of the righteous amongst nations? Uh, he we we know he he I mean he would have he, he should have qualified long time ago. It's a political question. I understand. Uh, and is anybody of the panelists aware where this where this question stands at the moment? Thank you. Thank you, dear Rena. Um, I think the, the 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 most recent that I read was the fact that uh, last year there were new um, archives um, that were open in Vatican, uh, which provide more evidence to the fact that. Uh, um, that uh, his role in saving uh, the hundreds of uh, Jewish kids and placing them with the monasteries and uh, um, uh, being able to, you know, to save them, um, and also of his letters to the Pope, um, where he um, calls the uh, Nazi regime a um, kind of um, devil-like regime uh, and asks for the attention of the Pope towards it. My understanding is that these archives did not really improve the understanding of the Pope's uh, role during the Second World War, but actually they do uh, give another testimony to the fact that Andrei Sheptitsky um, was making every single effort he could to save the lives of the Jewish kids. And Yad Vashem is supposed to come back after the pandemics, uh, um, you know, to reconsidering their position on, on, on him. Maybe Pavlo or Olesa or others can, can provide more, um, more data on it. Yeah, I, I would like just to uh, add, uh, um, this question was posed to Professor Yuri Skira, uh, I think a year or two years ago on Shepisky conference. So his answer was that Ukrainian uh, historians should work more in order to make uh, their argumentation based on uh, archival data uh, a bit more explicit and uh, uh, promote the question of uh, the awarding to Shapisky with this title. So, uh, so he, he, he said that Ukrainian historians should, 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 should do a little bit of their homework there. Thank you, Pavlo. Thank you, Rena, for the question and for the, for the valuable commentary. I see Olesa pop up, does it? Oh, perhaps I'll, I'll just very quickly chip in because it's sort of uh, some of the questions that the, the um, attendees might not be seeing in the Q&A box also relate to the question of uh, um, the, the Andrei Shaptisky not being awarded the title of Righteous Among Nations and relating to um, his role in the formation of the Waffen SS Galicia Division, and that's the topic of my research. Um, while I've not investigated the role of Andrei Shaptisky in any great um, depth, um, I think in relation to the Galicia Division specifically, it's also important to remember that um, sending chaplains, Ukrainian Greek Catholic chaplains to the division was a matter of maintaining a Ukrainian character of that specific division. And it was, a, um, it was preferable, I think, for those who joined the division to have those chaplains than not to have them in order to maintain that Ukrainian, um, uh, Ukrainian identity, I suppose, um, which was fragile. Um, and also, um, the, there, there is an argument that by um, not objecting to the formation of the Ukrainian, uh, of the Galicia, Galicia division um, uh, formation, Sheptitsky understood that, you know, it's, it's potentially um, useful for Ukraine or potentially more useful for Ukrainians to be organized in, 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 in a structure, in some kind of structured military formation rather than 
uh, especially in the chaos of the, the war and the war coming to, uh, to the state that it was coming uh, to in 1943, then to join um, other groups, uh, other armed formations. It's also, I think, useful to bear in mind that in 1943, when the Galicia Division was formed, he was already an elderly man. Um, he wasn't well. Um, uh, and um, he was, you know, he was focused, he was in a very complicated, uh, complicated position, but I completely agree that this requires further research, and research is being done, there's an excellent piece, um, I don't have it handy right now, but you could look it up or write to me and I'll find it for you, by John Paul Himka, uh, there's another one um, specifically looking at the Holocaust and uh, the role of Andrei Shaplitsky, uh, by Shimon Redlich, uh, one of the, the survivors of the Holocaust uh, from Ukraine, um, a professor in Israel. And that's enough from me. Sorry. Um, sorry to... You. So you. You're like magic <laughs> popping up in difficult questions. Yeah, and if I can just add, uh, if you go on YouTube, there was uh, a, an event dedicated to the topic, yeah, Shaptiskin Holocaust, uh, organized by the uh, Ukrainian Institute in London a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, with uh, Marina Presenti uh, moderating, so uh, maybe you can get something from there. Who is, the, by the way, our next uh, guest to, to talk, Maria? Please welcome. Yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, what a delightful discussion. I would like to describe a little bit my journey to Sheptitsky, because I'm somebody who comes from central Ukraine. And uh, Sheptitsky is not necessarily part of my history, as you can imagine. Um, and I would like to say that a few years ago, I was lucky enough to witness the inauguration of the Shuptitsky Center at the Ukrainian Catholic University, an amazing building, which I think really emblematic and symbolic of Ukraine's kind of um, spiritual and cultural renaissance that it is, it is undergoing. And uh, at the opening, there was a very nice exhibition about Shuptitsky, which really helped me to discover for the first time that there was much more to Shuptitsky than just being a leader of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Um, and, uh, you know, step by step, I realized, you know, that he was an entrepreneur, that he was a social thinker, that he was building institutions at the time when Ukrainian community uh, was uh, having a very difficult situation um, as part of the Polish state and then during the German occupation and Soviet occupation. Um, and then I uh, had this personal touch towards Shuptitsky when uh, we organized this event with Lily Polman, as um, uh, Pavlo just mentioned, who is a Holocaust survivor and who was saved, she and her mother, uh, who were saved by Shuptitsky personally uh, during the, um, you know, the Second World War in Lviv, and she described it very eloquently and um, you know, it's in London, so it was this very interesting connection to Shuptitsky, you know, which took place in London. Uh, and I just would like to mention that Lily Polman actually spent decades trying to petition Yad Vashem uh, to uh, recognize Shuptitsky as righteous among the nations unsuccessfully, as we know. And I would imagine she came under lots of criticism within the uh, Jewish community for you know, being so firm in, in, her, uh, in her beliefs. So really kudos to her. Um, my question is on a slightly different topic um, is um, how do you think, what were so-called um, stakeholder engagement skills of Shuptitsky? Because by the sound of it, the changes that he introduced were really revolutionary. How did he manage to get other players on board of his ideas? Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Who would like to answer? Sophia, please. Maybe I will start and then my colleagues will um, add. And again, these are just my uh, assumptions <laughs> in some way. Um, I think he used in a good way um, quite um, a traditional structure of the church. Um, so there were priests who were his subordinates and he could lead them in a good way. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we, we criticize traditional structures nowadays, but um, probably at that time, it was, um, uh, it was a good instrument which helped him because indeed uh, change agents of everything he was trying to do were in the first place priests. 
uh, there were very high expectations to them, not just to, to have uh, um, good speech uh, on Sunday, um, as Pavlo mentioned, at one hour of entertainment, which is called liturgy, but there was quite high expectation to priests to organize uh, uh, education, culture, entrepreneurship, and indeed um, the start of cooperative movement. Um, it started with priests who who uh, who who influenced the, all the all this movement, and they were the first one who participated in that. So um, I don't know how other state other stakeholders were uh, taken on board at that time. Uh, this Scandinavian discussion approach and uh, consensus approach was very much practiced. I don't really know, uh, but I also think that another uh, element which was I think quite important that uh, Shabtitsky was engaging people who were sometimes uh, of uh, different uh, beliefs. Uh, sometimes we don't know if they believed in God at all, but, but he's, he was engaging uh, uh, some experts uh, in different topics. He was um, uh, asking advices from, uh, from such people. And uh, I think in some way he was also trusting uh, quite many people, uh, even using this traditional or organizational chart, uh, chart of, uh, of church. Thank you, Sophie. I think uh, um, following what, uh, what Sophia had mentioned, I think one thing is to also uh, creating this army of change makers among the priests because of the, of the hierarchy, but I think he was investing a lot into them as well. So I think he not only had higher expectations of how their job descriptions should be changing, um, not just do the liturgy, but so many other things, but he was empowering, I think, them to learn, to be able to learn about them. And I think uh, there are sometimes discussions now whether, you know, modern Ukrainian priests, should they have the business administration degree? And we know that, you know, there are some really prominent um, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church uh, um, prelates right now who have studied at the school that Sophia has founded at Lviv Business, uh, Lviv Business School at the Ukrainian Catholic University. These are some of the best, some of the most brilliant Ukrainian uh, prelates of, of today. Um, so I think it was, it was a um, sort of a soft way to empower um, the priests to be able to, to lead their parishes. And then um, on the note of, um, uh, on the note of um, supporting various different uh, stratas, you know, he's known to invest into women's businesses, which probably was not a commonality at the time. Um, but I think in, in that way, in a soft way of, of empowering and, I don't know, helping a lady, a certain lady to create Fortuna Nova or, or other enterprises, this was his contribution to uh, probably um, prepare the ground for you know more of the egalitarian and uh, society that uh, ukrainian community could have become than it is even right now um, but this is where let's say scandinavians went into and i think it's a huge part of their their success uh, uh, right now um, so i think he he was finding various both hard and soft ways of, of dealing with different um, stakeholders and just to add uh... I think that Silshapitsky didn't manage to get everybody on board. Eh? And for example, within the church, uh, he was uh, criticized. Uh, uh, one of like probably most prominent uh, uh, persons who were in opposition to Shapitsky was the uh, bishop of uh, Stanislaviv, uh, today Ivano Frankivsk uh, uh, Commission. Uh, who is beatified? Uh, who, who, who was probably a brilliant person, but he, he, his style was much more clerical. He wanted to impose celibacy onto priests, and he was challenging Shapitsky all the time. Uh, and Shapitsky never surrendered. Uh, he continued to do to bring the church in the direction he thought it should go, with a lot of patience, but also contested. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pavlo. And this, uh, I will remind you, a non-expert speaker's talk, and imagine what would be happening with expert speakers today. Um, we have a question from Irina Kupczynska, which uh, goes in line with what we are discussing right now. Natalia and Oksana mentioned that priests and church should have say in reskilling of Ukrainians. Do you think that Szeptycki would hold the same idea? And how do you see the role of the church in the process of digital transformation of Ukraine and digital literacy education? Um, well, I, I, my personal opinion is that church has a much potential to play a much bigger role on a, on a lot of issues, um, not just reskilling, because prior to reskilling, you have to sometimes build the foundation for it. So there are a lot of public education issues um, on which the church under the time of Szeptycki was speaking out clearly. And Sofia mentioned one of them, that there was a huge problem of alcoholism, which is also a little bit, you know, prevalent today. But at the time, um, you know, in the church, you could find the postcards. I have one of them in my family collection of postcards in Lviv from the times of Szeptycki, which is, let's celebrate without alcohol. What a novel idea to ask Ukrainians to celebrate without alcohol, but just think of an impact on public health if uh, the church today was uh, promoting such a message, or if the church was promoting other messages during pandemics, maybe, um, maybe changing some of the ways in which we worship or pray or are able to, um, to practice um, our faith uh, in the time of, uh, you know, the biggest uh, unprecedented challenge. Um, so that's on the notion of kind of public education and being a little bit ahead of, of time. Um, in terms of reskilling, you know, definitely, I think I've mentioned some of the tools that, that, that were applied at that time, you know, when, where there was complete non-literacy. And I think one of the researchers was, was describing um, Stanislav region at the time when he became um, the bishop there as, as a region where people mostly believed in magic and, and it was like very dark times. She, she said dark times in uh, overall because no electricity, no lighting, but also in the heads of the people. Um, but, you know, don't we have uh, very dark times right now in the minds of the people where there's so much disinformation, where there's so much um, um, you know, lack of truth uh, that, that again, um, we, we, we all need more of it. Uh, so what, what would be the role for it? And I think, you know, um, digitally, again, I think there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of ways in which uh, some of the um, modern priests of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church have even dealt during the pandemics to, you know, I think retain dialogue and, and, uh, and being able to service the, these, these kind of needs of the souls of, 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 of whom they're responsible for um, through digital tools. And uh, this, this is not going to go away. But at the same time, uh, you know, that that personal connection, people have to become aware of the new tools to be able to do that. And, and some already are becoming, you know, um, the YouTubes and TikToks and, and everything else. Thank you, Natalia. Sofia, Paula, anything to add on this question? Because I'm currently uh, thinking about monobanic yeah. church. So I think that um, that our approach to Szeptycki should be not uh, do what he did, but rather like be creative as he was creative. Uh, the genius of Szeptycki that he managed to uh, understand the context, the situation, and act accordingly. I don't think that the church today replicating what Szeptycki was doing uh, 50 years ago will be successful uh, in the same way. Eh? Uh, so uh, I think on the one hand, uh, the church should be going, engaging with, uh, why not, uh, digital literacy and communication. At the same time, the church also try should try to to find uh, its own place in modern society and if there are other players that are better and more effective than the church in something let them be eh? uh, somebody also should think about uh, as we would call it spiritual well-being of people eh? uh, we should look at our resources as the church whether we have people, Bishop Pitsky had a degree in law, eh? not every bishop today has a degree in law. Uh, 
not every priest can have a uh, yes, MBA. Uh, uh, we don't need to just repeat what Shepetsky uh, mm -hmm. did. Thank you, Pavlo. And I just want to mention, Irina, that I think uh, because of the Corona times uh, these days, digital transformation started because of the churches. How many people tried to figure out how to watch uh, the liturgy online? I think this is like one step to digital literacy. And I do think that church has a lot of potential in peace building practices, not only reskilling and making sense, but also trying to inspire people and set an example, as I, as I mentioned earlier, paying with monobank card. Um, uh, on Sundays would be a great opportunity. Um, I have a wonderful, we have a wonderful comment uh, from one of our trustee, Tras Dobko. I can't but read it um, out to all of us. Uh, thank you very much for the great panel. I have to leave now, but I want to leave my comments for reflection. Chesterton once pointed out that saints are an antidote to whatever the current age neglects. Such figures seem to restore the world to sanity by exaggerating whatever it has overlooked. In a sense, church often plays a vicarious role, filling the gaps in people's life, especially following the call of Christ to go where there is suffering and misery. It was always a challenge for secular authorities to make a preferential option for the poor. So I believe that today Shaptitsky would try to identify what are faces of the contemporary Ukrainian needs and poverty and go there to fix it. This would be probably a response to the crisis of family, IDPs, oligarchism, politics and economics, marginalization of vulnerable people, economic poverty, contemporary forms of addiction, etc. I think you could try to empower Ukrainians to overcome their second health, second hand self-protection and gain more self-confidence. I think this is one of the best ways to start wrapping up our discussion. And before I give floor to Alessa, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for coming. And uh, uh, I would like for each of our speakers to still finish the sentence I asked earlier. So what Ukraine is, if you get inspired by Sheptitsky, for me, the sentence would be that Ukraine is a country that stands for values and protects the value system and gives chances to do it together with the whole Europe. Um, Natalia, could you summarize in one sentence what would be your main take out? Um, I'm very thankful for that last comment uh, that, that you had mentioned. Uh, and I agree with Pablo that it's not a matter of replicating, it's a matter of uh, striving for more. Um, he strived for more and made the maximum of his lifetime um, in, in, in everything that he did. And I think anyone who is a member of any congregation, church or, or entrepreneurship or um, academia or in any field, you know, can take that as an inspiration. I think uh, um, to me, um, um, Ukraine is a, um, you know, as a society that where human value has, um, um, where, where human life has a value and where um, the freedom and responsibility can be in balance. That's the, that's the Ukraine that, um, that I think we, we need to, to strive towards uh, where every human being can have a dignified, uh, dignified life. Uh, where human life is not a statistic. Thank you. Um, That's an inspiring quote. Thank you. Sophia. Uh, well, for me, it's a land of opportunity if we do our homework. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Write it somewhere big. Pavlo. I think Ukraine uh, is its people, huh? rich and poor, uh, right wing, left wing. Uh, Orthodox, Catholics, Jews, atheists, uh, we are Ukraine. Eh? And we are happy to have all of them here. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Olesa, over to you. Right, and now I will thank our guests, uh, Natalia Popovic, Sofia Opatska, Pavlos Matsnyuk, and Oksana Lomishka for this absolutely excellent discussion. And to all, uh, thank you, a huge thank you to all of you for attending um, and asking your questions. We hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a wonderful day, uh, evening. Uh, and season. Goodbye.